Well, again, uh, this evening we're coming to the last of the Beatitudes, which is you are blessed if you are persecuted. And we do want to kind of change our orientation this evening if we should think it is really otherwise. And sometimes we, we do live as though it is otherwise. Hmm. I don't know what's causing all these uh, snaps and pops. Hold on just a second. Let me see if there's anything unusual going on here. I'm going to try one thing. I'm just going to turn it off, turn it on again, see if that ma matters. Well, we'll see where we go from here. All right, well, let me begin by reading the Beatitudes. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountains, or on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May the Lord bless uh, his word again to our hearing this evening. Our Lord, through the Beatitudes, and this is a little bit too high, <laughs> thank you, tells us that there are certain characteristics that he values, certain qualities that he loves. And I, I'm not talking just about Jesus, but I'm also talking about the Heavenly Father. These are the same virtues we've been noting that we find in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why the Father could say of Jesus at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, he didn't say that just because Jesus was a son, but he said that because being his son, he shared that same character, that same nature, that same kind of morality, that same holiness. And those virtues that he found pleasing in his son are the ones we've been looking at in the Beatitudes. So what exactly is Jesus telling us that the Father values? Well, he values a humble heart, uh, the willingness to take the lowest place to serve others. He values a heart that is grieved by the evil of sin, so grieved that we turn from it. He values a kind and a gentle heart, one that essentially radiates love for neighbor and desires the eternal well-being of a neighbor. A heart that desires what it is that he desires, not the honors, not the things of this world, but the things that are good, the things that are right. He values, as we read in Revelation chapter 3, a heart that is hot for him, zealous for him, not cold and especially not lukewarm. A heart that delights in showing mercy rather than insisting on justice. The willingness to forgive rather than to seek revenge, that reaches out in compassion even to an enemy, rather than passing by on the other side, as we saw in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He particularly delights in a heart that is committed to holiness, that longs to be purified from all the evil, all the sin that remains. Now we saw this morning that he values that heart that seeks to do for others what he has done for us through his son. A heart that loves peace, that seeks to be at peace with others, that preserves the peace and unity among the people of God, 
that is willing to become a mediator for peace, to get, as it were, involved where there is division and bring reconciliation, and particularly that is willing to bring peace between God and man by leading others to the only one who can bring about that peace or that reconciliation, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the gospel. Now, he loves his son because this is the kind of heart that he has. But he also sent his son into the world that he might give us his Holy Spirit so that we too might have this kind of heart. Now, this evening, what we want to consider as, as our Lord closes this particular section is that these virtues that he gives to us through the work of redemption, through the work of his Holy Spirit, actually come with a price. That if we become like Jesus, we will be treated like Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's saying here that we are blessed, that we have the blessing of salvation, and having that blessing, we can know that we are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven when the world begins to persecute us as it persecuted him. Now, I thought it would be helpful, first of all, to just reflect on what it means to be persecuted. And I think we all have a sense of what it means. Uh, the word itself means to be singled out, and not favorably, but disfavorably, harassed, bullied, discriminated against, mistreated, hounded, pursued, or hunted. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely, note he says falsely, say all kinds of evil against you. Not that you've committed that evil, and they say it truly, but falsely because of me. He says in Luke 6, 22, parallel passage, Sermon on the Plain, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. This is what persecution is. Now, we know it can go further than that. It can include physical abuse. Remember after Peter and John were arrested and then they were ordered not to speak again in the name of Jesus, uh, they told them that we're not going to listen to you. We're going to listen to God. And so they went out and continued to preach and teach about Jesus. So they arrested them again. And this time, all the apostles, they examined them. They realized they weren't going to repent. And so they wanted to kill them. But then Gamaliel got up and gave his counsel. And we read in Acts 5, verse 40, they took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. It can include physical abuse, but it can also include abuse even to death, execution. We actually just sang about that in the hymn that we sang to open the service. Uh, the, one of the verses, I think it was the second verse, was referring to Stephen, who was the first martyr, who was stoned to death because he witnessed to the council about the fulfillment of God's promises through the Lord Jesus Christ. After he told them that he saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at his right hand, we read in Acts 7, verses 57 through 60, they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. By the way, let's not, for, let's not overlook the courage that Stephen had that he was willing to stand before those uh, ultimate, well, we can't say they ultimately had his life in their hands. It was in the hands of the Lord. 
And the Lord determined on this one occasion that he was going to allow them to fulfill their anger and hatred and allow Stephen to become the first martyr. But notice, secondly, that when he was being stoned, he didn't cry out for their execution. But like the Lord Jesus Christ from the cross, he cries that the Lord might forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. He showed mercy to them, you see, which our Lord calls us to do. Now, church history goes on to teach us that Jesus' followers were persecuted. And even though, as I mentioned in my prayer, that things maybe haven't been quite so bad for us today because we live in a, in a nation that comes out of a Christian background, that things are changing. And it's always been true that those whose hearts are in the world will hate and persecute those who belong to the Lord Jesus. Now, why is it that the world will persecute us? Why is it that they treat us in this way? In our text, Jesus actually gives us two reasons. First of all, he says, because of righteousness. In Matthew 5, verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does he mean by that? He means that they're going to hate us because we're doing the right thing. We're doing what the Lord actually calls us to do, what is right and good, what is loving towards God and toward our neighbor. And when we do that, because it exposes their wrongs, it exposes their sins, because this is not what they're doing, although they can still know in their minds this is what they should be doing. Remember the Lord gives us a conscience. The Holy Spirit works in our souls to convict us of sin. This is what you should be doing. And you're not doing this. We don't make them feel good. And so they will hate us for that reason. And secondly, because we're following the Lord Jesus, he says in verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, I think you understand that Jesus isn't really making a huge distinction between those two things. They really amount to the same thing. They will hate us because we are becoming like him. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12. Now you, Timothy, followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Sounds like Psalm 37 that I read for the call to worship. But then he goes on to say this. Indeed, all who live or who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not because they just desire to do it, but because they are, in fact, doing it. When we become like Jesus, we'll be treated like Jesus. When we serve others like him, when we turn away from the sinful things that other people are doing, when we are kind and gentle and have this meek kind of spirit, when we insist on doing the right things, when we forgive our enemies or even reach out in compassion to try to help them, when we try to overcome the sinful things that we do, when we try to reconcile those who are at odds, and especially when we try to reconcile the people of this world with our Lord Jesus, with God through Jesus Christ, the people of this world are gonna hate us because this is what Jesus is like, and they hated him. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verses 18 through 20, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Jesus also warned the 12 before he sent them out to teach and preach in the towns and villages around uh, Palestine. In Matthew 10, verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more 
will they malign the members of his household? The world is going to treat us in this way because they treated Jesus in this way, because this is what they think of Jesus. Remember, Jesus was hated. Jesus was slandered. Jesus was harassed. Jesus was abused. On one occasion, the Jews wanted to take Jesus and throw him off a cliff. On another occasion, they picked up stones to stone him. They accused him of being in league with the devil. The Jews in Jerusalem were always looking for an opportunity to take him secretly, if they could, and put him to death. They finally did get a hold of him. They arrested him. They put him on trial. They condemned him on trumped-up charges, handed him over to the Romans, and he was executed. That's what they thought of Jesus. Now, why did they treat Jesus like that? Jesus, had he done anything wrong? Of course not. He did everything absolutely right, absolutely perfect. The only thing that Jesus was guilty of was simply loving the Father with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. He was reaching out to the Jews in his grace and love, offering to them the gospel telling them that he was the fulfillment of all the promises of God, and if they would only come to him and trust in him, he would give them rest. He would relieve them of the burden of their sins, and he would open heaven for them. He was the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Jesus did nothing wrong. The problem wasn't with Jesus. The problem was with them. Now, the problem also uh, won't be ours, when we live as he calls us to live and we are hated the problem is going to be with the world jesus explained this earlier in his ministry in john chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 and again jesus here tells us what the world thinks of him and what the world thinks of what he has to say this is the judgment he says that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now, again, it's not all negative. There's also the positive. He goes on to say, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And in a similar way... The world is going to respond to us as we shine the light of the gospel, as we shine the light of the nature and character of Jesus, as we live as Jesus calls us to live. We're going to be thought of in the same way if we become like him. Uh, by the way we live, by the things we say, we will be treated as he was treated. And we have to bank on that. We have to count on that. Jesus tells us that's the way it is. And we know that it's true. It's one of the prices we have to be willing to pay to follow Jesus. But we also have to bear in mind that we're not going to have this effect on everyone. There will be those that will be drawn to him through what we say and what we do, through our personal witness, through our good works. Jesus says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But at the same time, let's not forget as we live like Jesus in this world, we're going to be hated by most people in varying degrees. And again, as the restraint of the Holy Spirit seems to be weakening in our culture, that may actually end up being greater and greater as time goes on. But that's the reality. But what should we think about that? When we are treated in this way, Jesus tells us that we are blessed. And that's what we need to keep before us. We're blessed, first of all, because like the other Beatitudes, when we see this happening in our lives, it confirms that we belong to Jesus and we are the heirs of his kingdom, which is what Jesus means when he says in Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As Sinclair Ferguson said not too long ago, when we become enough like Jesus, to be able to draw that attention from the world, that's a blessing to be like him. And especially to be like him enough that people can see it. We're blessed, secondly, because Jesus promises to reward us for everything that we have to suffer for him. 
He says in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad when you're persecuted, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we look through scripture, we will see that when great sacrifices are, when we're called to make great sacrifices by the Lord, there's also great rewards. And that means that there are degrees of reward in heaven. We do need to remember that it's not the same for everyone. There are places of honor in heaven. Remember James and John asked for those places of honor, but Jesus said, you're going to have to go through what I go through in order to achieve it. And they said, well, we're willing to do that. And he says, well, you're still not going to get it, but you will go through what I went through. But the more you go through uh, what the Lord calls you to go through, the more we do for him, the more we suffer for him, the greater our reward will be in heaven, which is why Jesus tells us we should be actively working to store up our treasures in heaven rather than on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. And the one thing he didn't mention in that particular context is when you die, you have to leave it all behind. You don't get to keep it forever, except for what we do for him, except for what we suffer for him, except for what we give to him. Those are the things we get to take out of the world. Now, Jesus says we're going to be rewarded as the prophets. Your reward in heaven is great because they persecuted the prophets. They were persecuted. They were rewarded. You're persecuted. You'll be rewarded as well. When you look in the Bible at how the prophets were treated, you might be tempted to say, you know, I don't want to go that direction. I don't want to be treated the way they were treated. But if you could see the prophets now in heaven enjoying the reward they have now, not to mention the one they're going to receive on the day of judgment when they enter into the new heavens and the new earth, if you could see how happy they are and how much the Lord has blessed them, you would choose that same path. And again, I would draw your attention to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 through 18. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That glory that we'll receive, he says, is, is a weight that is far beyond all comparison. And actually, um, as we were looking at last time, remember that um, those who are pure in heart will see God. That's one of the greatest things that we will get to enjoy, is to see that blessed vision of God. Now, those are the things that Jesus mentions here, but there's other reasons mentioned in the Bible why we are blessed if we're persecuted. We're blessed because we were considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's what the apostles thought when they were flogged and then threatened and released. They rejoiced. We're blessed because we have been counted worthy to take the abuse that is meant for the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way that he took the abuse that was meant for us when he hung on the cross. Remember, everything that was done to Jesus was done to him because he was suffering for us. Paul writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, nothing with regard to his atonement. But the world has not dealt the blow to Jesus that they've wanted to deal to him, so they go after his disciples. And Paul says he rejoices that he was able to take some of that meant for Jesus upon himself. We're blessed because the Lord tells us that if, if in our suffering we lose certain things, I mean, sometimes persecution means your own household is going to hate you, and you might lose brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and various things, possessions perhaps even taken away from you. But the Lord promises that he will give back to us many more times in this life whatever we may have to give up and, of course, what's coming in, in the future in heaven. He says in Matthew 10, verses 29 through 30, in the same context in which he, t he warned them as they go out, if they malign me, they're going to malign you. But he says this, truly, truly, or truly, I say to you, 
There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Sometimes we suffer the loss of things, but there is nothing that we give up that the Lord will not richly reward us in return. And we're blessed because we know that whatever happens to us in this life, no matter what persecutions we have to endure, no matter even if we have to lay down our lives, nothing can take from us the love of Christ and that kingdom that he has promised to us. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 35 through 39, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when we see persecution in this light, it can actually make us glad when it happens instead of grieving over the fact that it has. Uh, when Paul and Silas were arrested, remember they were beaten publicly. They were in prison, their feet in the stocks. And in the midst of the persecution, they weren't lamenting the fact that they had to suffer the things they were suffering. But rather, they rejoiced and they worshiped God. We read in Acts 16, verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I mean, what a witness to be able to rejoice in suffering. I mentioned earlier that the apostles, when they were arrested and threatened, they thought maybe they were going to die, but then they were flogged instead and threatened. We read in Acts 5, verse 41, they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. It was a cause of rejoicing, not a, not a time of lamenting that they had to go through such difficult times. And now again, I realize none of us are necessarily gonna look forward to being treated this way. But when we realize why we're being treated and on whose behalf we're being treated this way and what this is working together for us in heaven, then it's really a blessing. It's not something to avoid, but if the Lord calls us to go through it, it's, it really is a blessing to be able to take this abuse that was meant for Jesus. So let's be encouraged not to be afraid of persecution. Jesus tells us ahead of time that we'll, we will have to face it for serving him. Let's not be afraid of it, but instead let's be ready for it and let's be encouraged or even, I should say, as it happens, to be willing to go through it because of the blessings that it actually brings. In closing, let me just read this passage of Peter because I think it is so encouraging. Again, it uh, reminds us what a blessing it is to suffer for him. He says this in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing. And I think he has in mind here persecution. As though some strange thing were happening to you. It's not strange. Jesus told you this is the way it was going to be. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation when Jesus comes again. Okay, You may rejoice. And listen to what he says in closing here. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now, he's not saying here that you know, you're walking along and all of a sudden the Spirit comes on you and people begin to hate you and you're blessed because he came upon you in this sort of transient way. But what he's saying is if you're saved, 
and you have the spirit of glory, the spirit of God indwelling you and empowering you. You're becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to be reviled for his name. But if that happens, you're blessed because you are like him. It shows the spirit of glory of God really does rest on you. So may the Lord fill us with the spirit, make us more like Jesus, and give us, again, the ability to rejoice if we should suffer for his name's sake. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us and to encourage us in this way.